According to Graham Hancock, there are a lot of hidden and unexplained facts about the Great Wall of China that do not make sense. After looking at these discoveries that Graham Hancock made, it's easy to understand why people think that the Great Wall of China was not built by Chinese. Because even Graham does not understand the mystery of the Great Wall of China. How these things could happen on Earth, and archaeologists have no answers. This is a very interesting story of the mysterious Great Wall of China, so let's explain it. So, there are many questions about this ancient structure. For example, some sections of the wall, particularly those in the Gobi Desert, appear to deviate from any logical defensive route, leading to speculation about their true purpose. Ancient legends also speak of dragon veins, suggesting that the wall's placement may be influenced by geometric principles or cosmic energy lines. Furthermore, despite its vastness, there's no concrete evidence that the wall effectively deterred invaders raising questions about its primary function. The sheer manpower and resources required for its construction, combined with these enigmas, make the Great Wall a subject of enduring fascination. And it seems like Graham Hancock has a very interesting explanation for this mystery. Hancock's research spans various ancient sites, from the pyramids of Egypt to the underwater ruins off the coast of Japan. Graham also theorizes that the Great Wall of China is much older than is commonly believed, and that it was built by a lost civilization that predated the Qin Dynasty. Hancock's work has also attracted a large following of enthusiasts who believe that he is onto something. One of the main pieces of evidence that Hancock cites in support of his theory is the fact that the Great Wall is made up of many different sections that were built over a long period of time. He argues that these sections could not have all been built by the Qin Dynasty, which only ruled China for a brief period of time. Hancock also points to the fact that the Great Wall is much larger and more complex than is necessary for military purposes. He believes that it must have been built for some other reason, such as to mark the boundaries of a lost civilization. Hancock's theory about the Great Wall is still controversial, but it has sparked a renewed interest in the ancient history of China. One of the most compelling pieces of evidence Hancock discusses comes from the underwater structures near Yanaguni, Japan. These structures submerged below the ocean surface display signs of intricate carvings and construction techniques. Hancock proposes that these ruins might be evidence of a sophisticated civilization that existed during the last ice age, more than 10,000 years ago. If true, this would drastically shift our understanding of ancient human history. With that, Hancock's claims often collide with the findings of mainstream archaeology. While traditional chronologies are built upon layers of evidence, including carbon dating, written records, and artifact analysis, Hancock asserts that these methods might sometimes overlook broader patterns or anomalies that suggest older origins. In addition, the exact start date for the construction of the Great Wall of China is unclear, but it's widely believed to have begun around the 7th century BC. In the tapestry of China's ancient past, the 7th century BC holds a crucial but often overlooked position. This era, situated in the broader context of the Zhou dynasty and the beginning of the spring and autumn period, provides intriguing insights into the size and population of Chinese people of the time. To truly understand these parameters, we must explore the geographical, societal, and historical dimensions of the period. During the 7th century BC, the realm we now recognize as China was a mosaic of distinct states and cultures. Much of these societies flourished in the fertile basins of the Yellow River. Hanghe and the Yangtze River, Changjing. The Zhu Dynasty, which had ushered in its rule around 1046 BC, continued its dominance through this century. While the Zhu kings theoretically exerted influence over a large swathe of the Chinese cultural landscape, the waning of their central power led to an era of fragmented and competitive states. Estimating the population of such a vast and diverse region is no simple task. Comprehensive, reliable records from this era are scarce if not entirely absent. Nevertheless, the collective wisdom of archaeological evidence, extant historical narratives, and extrapolations from successive periods provides a glimpse into the potential size of the population. The zoo territories, rich and varied, might have housed several millions of inhabitants. Taking into account regions beyond the zoo domain, the entire population of areas corresponding to modern-day China would certainly have been higher. The intricacies of societal dynamics during this era also played a pivotal role in shaping the population. Agriculture, 
serving as the backbone of ancient Chinese society, experience continued innovation. Rice cultivation in the southern regions and millet farming in the north not only sustained but also contributed to population growth. Simultaneously, the 7th century BC was marked by its fair share of upheavals. The spring and autumn period was replete with skirmishes and larger scale conflicts among the Zhu states. While these clashes inevitably led to casualties, they also instigated migrations, territorial expansions, and the occasional resettlement of peoples. As states vied for dominance, their boundaries ebbed and flowed, leading to fluid population dynamics. The burgeoning power of certain states gave rise to urban centers that emerged as vital hubs of administration, culture, and commerce. These urban nuclei attracted inhabitants from surrounding areas, leading to pockets of dense population within the vast Chinese landscape. Also, the construction of the wall is as much of a marvel of human labor and determination as it is a study in the materials and methods used to build it. The early walls, starting from the 7th century BC during the Warring States period, were not as elaborate as the later structures. They were primarily tamped earth constructions, using a method called hangtu. Workers would dig trenches and then fill them with layers of earth, gravel, and wood, which were compacted until they became solid. Given the vast expanse of the wall, the materials used were generally sourced locally. In areas where earth was abundant, like the vast plains of northern China, large amounts of rammed earth were used. This method was both economical and practical. When Emperor Qin Shi Hung unified China in the late 3rd century BC, he sought to connect and fortify the walls built by the previous states, leading to a more extensive and standardized construction. The Qin Dynasty introduced the use of bricks and stones in areas where they were readily available, especially in mountainous regions. The advantage of these materials was their durability compared to tamped earth. The most famous sections of the Great Wall, especially those near Beijing that tourists commonly visit, were constructed during the Ming Dynasty, 1368 to 1644. Facing threats from the Mongols, the Ming Dynasty invested heavily in the wall's reinforcement and expansion. The wall from this period was built using bricks, which provided both strength and uniformity. These bricks were often bound together with a mortar made of rice flour, lime, and water, which was surprisingly robust and weather-resistant. Additionally, large stones were used for the foundation, while bricks were used for the upper layers and the battlements. This combination of materials provided a sturdier structure that could withstand both environmental wear and military assault. In particularly mountainous terrains, the wall was built directly from the rock, making use of the natural landscape as a defensive measure. Watchtowers and fortresses, integral parts of the wall's defensive infrastructure, were constructed with bricks, wood, and tiles, and were strategically spaced to allow for communication and defense. The construction of the Great Wall was an immense endeavor that demanded both labor and ingenuity. The challenges posed by different terrains led to varied architectural solutions. In the Gobi Desert, for example, the wall was made from reeds and sand, while in areas prone to erosion, wood and bricks were used. The Chinese also developed techniques for transporting large quantities of materials over long distances, using a combination of manual labor, sleds, mules, and even water canals. Furthermore, the Great Wall of China has intrigued and inspired generations worldwide. Its persistence across millennia is not just a testament to ancient engineering prowess, but also to the consistent preservation efforts that have taken place over the centuries. Delving into its survival reveals a rich tapestry of factors that have ensured its longevity. Originally, the resilience of the Great Wall can be attributed to the robustness of its construction. Beyond just materials, the engineering techniques of the wall were revolutionary. Foundations were dug deep, walls constructed thick, and watchtowers strategically placed, not only for defensive purposes, but also to ensure structural integrity. Historically, especially during eras like the Ming Dynasty, the wall benefited from regular refurbishment and expansions. Dynastic rulers recognized its significance both as a defense mechanism and a symbol of imperial strength. They invested in its upkeep, ensuring that weakened sections were either fortified or rebuilt, ensuring its continuity through the ages. In more contemporary times, the recognition of the wall's historical, cultural, and touristic significance has catalyzed preservation efforts. Both local and national Chinese authorities, recognizing the wall's value, have channeled resources into its restoration. 
Using a harmonious blend of traditional techniques and modern technology, these efforts are sensitive to the wall's original construction, ensuring that restorations maintain authenticity. Alongside direct interventions on the wall itself, there have been regulations to prevent its surroundings from degradation through vandalism or unauthorized constructions. Further bolstering the wall's preservation has been its international recognition, particularly its designation as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1987. This not only drew global attention to its splendor, but also provided an avenue for resources and guidelines to facilitate its continued preservation. That's it for today. Subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell.